total moment. moment. Announcer Get this right up on the oh. show oh. and ask you this. Okay. But there's, there's a rumor, rumor that there's this intimidating, intimidating toothbrush, toothbrush that's, that's been terrorized. Listen. Listen, Linda. Have you been ran out of your home because of a toothbrush? I really did think. I was ran out of my family. We would not have a bone in our own. Nobody knows what we're talking about. I'm afraid. So um, it was a Monday morning a week ago, and I sleep really hard on Sunday nights because Sunday's a really, really big day for ministry, for worship leading and stuff. And so like I was out, and I was awoken from a dead sleep by a terrible noise. And, and it, it sounds like a Christmas story. And what was the clatter? Listen, it, it sounded like, like someone was sawing through, through my wall, wall and, and there, there was water, like, like a waterfall. And, and I called Justin, Justin to put it on, on speakerphone and I said, babe, this, this is not good. good. Like, <laughs> something really, really, really bad has happened. He's like, I'm just now pulling into the plant. And I'm like, it's, it's, it's really, really bad. bad. He, he goes, goes, okay, I'm pulling, pulling away from, from the plant. <laughs> and, 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 and he came home, and, and for 25 minutes, that's the song it takes him. I prayed, and I, I called, called him again. And I said, do I need, I need to take the kids for safety? safety? I got, got the dogs out of my room, because I thought that my room was going to blow up, and, and we were all going to die. I was really, really scared. And he came home, and he opens the shower door, and he said, babe, looks like my toothbrush fell off the ledge and, and somehow, somehow got turned, turned on, <laughs> turned the toothbrush <laughs> off, and, and we were saved, my hero. hero. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you guys, I'm a little bit shocked, so can, can I, I speak, speak on behalf of y'all, please? <laughs> Here's, Here's what, what, everybody, y'all feel free to chime in and, and, and tell, 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 tell everybody, everybody that you're agreeing with me here. here. Yes. Yes. So I learned a lot about you already, so here's the question. Okay. You, know, you know, there are, you know, on this planet, when, when something, something happens, happens, there are a million possibilities. Yes, yes. You, you went straight to the house is going to blow up. I went straight to the Lord in prayer. Well, well from the house. After your house is going to blow up. I mean, why, why couldn't it have been that there is a, uh, a, a mole who is boring your house? Listen, when I was like in the middle of school, our water heater exploded. It was going to blow up. Okay. When I was in middle school, well, in the bathroom, bathroom right, right next to my room, and so I thought, it's, it's happening again, and it's going to be okay. fire and water everywhere. I thought I it was over. That. I almost called my neighbors. It was over. I was like, was like, over. I just wondered why, why was there like a, a lack of investigation? investigation. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Justin got there and we hit five minutes. He was like, yeah, he's like, it was like 30 seconds. I'm in the bathroom. I mean, he did it anyway. I don't think the diligence was there. No, I'm going to die. Listen, I have never seen to have excellent technical skills. I've never seen a rock. It's a winning in the shower. Well, I don't know. The shower was going to blow me up. So I did not open the shower because I didn't want to die. Once you have these tools and stuff in place, you can sit in your underwear in your office and have fun, fun and, and, and act the fool and make, make as much as you want. Because that's, that's what these tools do. We are not wearing, wearing our underwear, underwear, by the way. Oh, I'm definitely not wearing underwear. I mean, I mean, I mean we're not wearing it. We're not wearing just our underwear. underwear. Oh, wow. <laughs> that is different. <laughs> that is completely different. Those are different words. Are different words. Are different words. Like, what are we talking about? Brothers and Tilly. It, it, it used, used to be a nice, nice Christian, Christian show. show. Yeah. Yeah. So you know that guy who came up to you and said, hey, let's hey, just get, 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 get through the, the weird stuff of the business. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now we know, well, now now we know, we know what he's talking about. It all started with the CBD comment. I just meant we weren't like inappropriate off camera. That's all I meant. Yes, yes, yes. No one's all We're definitely inappropriate off camera too. We leave the inappropriate stuff when we're on camera. Yeah. Yeah. The whole yeah. thing is, I, I have not, not in, 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 in my, my heart. In my heart. She's trying to feel guilty. No, I'm telling you, I thought that toothbrush was going to be 
I'm I'm saying saying you to your pastor, your pastor has to get him. Yeah. Please, Please do, do not, not listen, listen to this episode. It was innocent. It was innocent. I really didn't think that my house was going to explode. I need to protect my children and my dogs. And I was trying to figure out a... A plan, a plan for safety. safety. Yeah, the, whole, the worst, worst comment, comment <laughs> and <laughs> ever made, and, and one, one that still leaves us all asking, why is an electric toothbrush in the shower? <laughs> <laughs> Six o'clock will help tell you tell your story. story. I want to tell you nothing, nothing sells better. better. Nothing, nothing you do. do. There, there is nothing you can do or say that is going to do better for you than telling, telling your story. story. Your, your story has, has more power, power and more uh, potential for you to turn a profit, to grow your platform, to be able to widen your footprint, to have more impact, to be able to reach more people in a much more deeper and meaningful way that, that builds that, that rapport that you so desperately need and want for your business. Nothing will do that better than telling your story. Everybody's got one. I like, I like what, what Eric Thomas, Thomas said one time. He says, I might, I might not have been through what you've been through, through but I've been, been through my go through. through. And, and telling people what you've had, had to go through, through helps, helps them understand, understand okay, okay, this is a real person. person. It, it encourages them. them. What, what is encouraging, encouraging people? It's literally, literally taking courage and putting it on the inside of them. When I tell my story how it was just in 2008, I was broke, busted, disgusted. I was almost, I mean, just steps away from being homeless. Our house was being foreclosed on. I mean, we were literally days away from get out of the house, a house that we had lived in my whole life. I was raised there, been in my family for years. It was the old family farm. My great grandparents met at a barn dance on that piece of property. Telling that story and finding myself in a food bank looking for benevolence to feed a family of five, uh, five children and a wife, actually, a family of seven. Telling that story informs people that, hey, I don't know where you're at, but I've had my own thing. I, I get struggled. And it also under, lets them understand why I'm so passionate about what I do. Because the very training, the tools, the technology that I use today is how I, just in a, a short period of just a decade, have gone from the outhouse back to the penthouse. But my... More than the software, the citizens. Why is it that people don't want to grow? Why is it that they just settle for being less than what they are capable of being? Why is it that they shy away from doing their stuff and challenging themselves and taking life on and making it an exciting adventure? Why is it? Because living your dream is hard, ladies and gentlemen. It's hard living your dream. We are in charge of our attitudes. And when you're in charge of your attitude, you say, if it's hard, then do it hard. I won't allow this to stop me. I don't have the option of easy. I don't have the option. And I don't think you do, or any of us do. I'm going around trying to find a dream. That's, That's a little, little dream that doesn't require much responsibility, responsibility or not too stressful. I won't, won't be too much of a hassle. No, no, no. no. I am convinced that life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. The optimist sees an opportunity in every calamity. A pessimist sees a calamity in every opportunity. What can make you make it okay? Your attitude about it. That you decide that this is not going to determine who I am. Charles Wendell said about attitude, he said, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact attitude has on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. That is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures and successes, than what other people think or say or do. It is more important than appearances, giftedness, or skill. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play the one string we have, and that is our attitude. If there's anything in life that you don't currently have right now, it's because of who you are and how you think. I know you're strong enough to do it because you're human. And every human has what it takes to get past whatever they're going through if they decide to push through it. Push through it. Tragedy and trials come to everybody. Only the strong survive. 
Y'all running from pain. Y'all running from challenges. You telling me how difficult your life is. Do you understand it is the difficulty that's going to prepare you and take you to that next level? I'm here just like you here, and I promise you, I ain't leaving without the degree. I will not leave without that goal. I will not leave without that dream. I will not leave this university until I'm successful. I will not leave this job. I will not leave this client. I will not leave this opportunity until I get it. You're listening to TW3 Radio, inspiring, informative, and entertaining talk and music for the entrepreneur and small business owner. Inspiring, informative, and entertaining talk and music. You're listening to TW3 Radio. How could a man hit a target he could not see? That's a pretty good question. Here's another one. How can you hit a target you do not have? Besides, planes are built for flying, ships are built for sailing, houses are built for living, and man too was built for purpose. He was designed for accomplishment, he's engineered for success, he's endowed with the seeds of greatness, and the greatest danger we as human beings have is when we do not do anything at all. People today complain of lack of time. It's not lack of time that's the problem, it's the lack of direction. Are you a wandering generality? Or are you a meaningful, specific? Are you going to work tomorrow because that's what you did yesterday? If that's the reason you're going tomorrow, you won't be as good tomorrow as you were yesterday because you're two days older and no closer to the goal you do not have. What about you personally? Have you got your goals laid out? Are you a meaningful specific or are you a wandering generality? See, you are part of an equation, and you are needed. Part of why we should begin to look at how we give up our lives, is that we've got to begin to see what is it that I'm supposed to do, what is my life work, and then give ourselves to that. Because as we do that, ladies and gentlemen, I guarantee you, as you begin to take on this new era that we're in, if you decide that I'm going to begin to start living life, I'm going to start giving more of myself. I'm going to start putting out more, contributing more to life. Here's what's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. I guarantee you that life will take on a whole new meaning for you. I guarantee you that life takes on a whole new dimension. That you'll be happier. You have a greater sense of happiness and fulfillment in life. That now you will begin to take off on some new paths to some new horizons. That you'll begin to see life totally different than most people. You gotta have those long range goals. And the rule is a simple one. You go as far as you can see. And when you get there, you'll always be able to see further. Are you a wandering generality? Or are you a meaningful specific? And most of us go through life because we're not using that which we've been given that we are punished, that we're going through life getting up in the morning with no reason to get up. There's a scripture, when I heard it, I couldn't understand it. I say, how cold? He that hath shall get, and he that hath not even that that he has shall be taken away. He that hath a generous view of life, he that has courage, he that hath initiative, he that hath resourcefulness, I say it with all of my heart, I know in my mind that man was designed for accomplishment, that he's engineered for success, that he is endowed with the seeds of greatness. You're listening to TW3 Radio, inspiring, informative, and entertaining talk and music for the entrepreneur and small business owner. Welcome 
to TerryWilson3.com, home of TW3, the most powerful marketing tools, training, and technology on planet Earth. Planet Earth. Get ready to earn, enjoy, and experience more than you ever dreamed was possible. If you're tired of just getting by and ready to really thrive, then buckle in and listen up. Here's your host, Terry Wilson. Thank you, Keith. This is Terry Wilson. This is episode 452, and we are speaking with rock stars tonight. Uh, I have the privilege to be surrounded by a ton of them. To my left in the studio is one of the brightest, talented, most uh, kind people I know that's going to uh, show up and show out in any field that he ever goes into, and that is my son in whom I'm well pleased, uh, The River. He's he's bringing the flow. Sorry, I didn't unmute you there. It's all right. (laughs) So we got him, and then in the Northern Command up there in Chi-Town, the one, the legend, uh, our own uh, f- part of the family, Tom from Chi-Town. Tom, how are you doing? You know, I am doing well, and welcome to Chicago, where it is currently one degree. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Well, hopefully we can warm it up tonight with some value bombs that uh, you're going to be dropping on the folks, and uh, we're going to absolutely warm it up in the next week or two. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we're bringing someone that brings the heat. Uh, he is the man that is called Entrepreneur on Fire, uh, and we got a special announcement of how he's going to be joining us in the coming week, so that's uh, that's going to be fun. But tonight, tonight's show is about rock stars. Tom's a rock star. River is a rock star, and we got a bona fide, certified, award-winning rock star that yeah. we're going to be interviewing. Can you believe that? You're, I can't. Can you believe your dad? I cannot believe that. <laughs> now, but they'll let anybody do That's this. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. How do they agree to this? I don't know. It ought to be against the law somewhere. <laughs> Uh, it's amazing. It's amazing. But we got the man, the legend, the timekeeper for so many hit makers uh, from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, Chicago, Kenny Loggins, Michael McDonald, Al Jarreau, Richard Marks, and tons of others. The legendary rock star, Tris M. Bowden, is with us tonight. And so if you're a musician, a musician fan, a music fan, uh, you're going to love it. If you are saying, Terry, what does this got to do with business? Uh, the last part of the interview, he gets in into uh, his battle with overcoming an illness and sickness. And listen, one of the things I've learned about business is it's not easy, but it's worth it. And one of the things that you're always going to have to fight against is it could be uh, financial pushback. It could be relationships that uh, are pushing back on you. It could be the economy at the time. It could be pandemics, pandemoniums and politics, as I like to say. And sometimes it's just the crap of life. And Tom, you know a little bit about that as well that you just have to push through, don't you, brother? Absolutely. Every every day you wake up, you're going to fight something, so be prepared for it. New levels, new devils, baby. So uh, Absolutely. He's going to be bringing the heat and talking about his bout with cancer. He was given a 14% chance of survival within five years with the whatever, and that, that was 12 wow. years ago. And he's still rocking it out. So it's just great, great story of how someone's on the top of their game. He's got his business just so happens to be a professional musician and uh, he's still doing business. And so I love it. I love it. So uh, we got that going on. River, uh, what are you doing this week that's going to be bringing value to the world? Uh, Working out, you know, (laughs) working out, lifting weights. Uh, School, School, you know, the 17 year old life, the 17 year old life, prosperous, the prosperous 17 year old life that, uh, uh, works at the restaurant and which is cool. They let you listen to your uh, podcast. Podcast, Yeah. yeah. So so you're overdosing on Joe Rogan and Jordan Peterson and all of those. So that's great. (laughs) Well, that's great. Well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm proud of you and I I love seeing what you're doing in in your world. And so that's great. And thank you for being on the night. Uh, Tom, uh, Reagan, his counterpart, uh, is, is busy doing honeydew stuff uh, because of a wedding coming up. He and acts so, like he's busy. Yeah, he acts like he's got response. And see what happens when you grow up it's and crazy. get married. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tom, uh, what what are you into? I have uh, I've got a, a, a bunch of projects that, that uh, some of them with deadlines, some of them approaching deadlines. Uh, of course, those uh, those who are familiar with the TW three radio network. Uh, know that I've got a podcast and a a new one uh, that will be launching uh, this Thursday. Kind of proud of that one. 
Very cool. Very cool. Well, uh, you know, we had a great uh, time this past Wednesday in our mastermind group uh, with a, a one of my personal friends and a coach of mine. And uh, I was just going to ask you, I've got my own opinions on the value of coaching and the value of uh, mentorship and the value of being in a mastermind. But I wanted to hear straight from the rock star up in Chicago, Tom, what do you, what's, what, what value do you place? on coaching and how important has it been for your personal growth in business and in life? Sure. Uh, actually, I spent a few minutes talking about that on this upcoming podcast. Uh, but my my thoughts on coaching have, were really developed as a young, at a young age. I mean, I, I played a lot of sports when I was growing up. Of course, you had a coach. And what was the purpose of the coach? Coach was there to show you how the game is played, uh, strategies, techniques, things like that. And in business, it's no different. You know, I, I raised the analogy in my in my show this week, and I'll just leave it here. If you decide to go down a particular trail, just any trail you can imagine, and at the beginning of the trail, they say, here's a book, this will get you here to the end. Or if they say, there's a guy who walks this trail every day, which do you think will be your fastest and less painful way to the end? Yeah, that's, that is a great analogy. I mean. You know, we're, we're all going to make mistakes in anything that we reach out and try to do. Nothing new comes natural. I mean, it's just the awkwardness of the newness, right? Right. Why not leverage and learn from the mistakes of others? Because you're going to have your own. Right. <laughs> and, and you might be able to prevent some that you would have otherwise made simply by, like you said, Tom, having that guide. Right. And uh, I... One of the things that has come painfully, painfully uh, uh, in my mind and just a, a reality I'm staring at every week now is I'm thankful the good Lord of what we've got here at TW3. And I'm so proud of uh, the people we've got like you and others and just just the wonderful, wonderful ecosystem of entrepreneurs that have been built. But here's my one regret. God, I wished I had gotten a hold of some coaching 10, 12 years ago. I mean, we're successful, but boy, I think we'd be triple, quadruple, 10 times. Uh, who knows the factor that it would have exponentially grown our business. And some of the, because I'm, I'm, I'm going through and just networking with all of these top chef entrepreneurs that are in online marketing and coaching and in that space. And I'm hearing their stories and I'm hearing how they've grown their business. And I'm seeing, and I'm like, you know, five years ago, I zigged when I should have zagged and I would have known to zag had I been connected to this group here or this group here. And it's just, uh, you're right. Do you want just a, a map or do you want the map and the guide to go to, to go? It's just, that's such a great analogy. What, um, you know, you're, you, you were a sales professional, been in the car business, been in all different types of business finance and, and other, other areas. Uh, what's the importance to you? What, what value do you place on having a system in place to generate uh, qualified people to speak with, to qualify those people, and to, to be able to uh, bring those people from being suspects to prospects and prospects to eventual clients? So that system that, that does that, what, what kind of value do you put place on that, Tom? Quite honestly, if you get a system that does those things, you can't put a price on it, period. You just can't do it. And, and I'll let you in on a dirty little secret, and most of you know what, or may know what I'm about to say. In other forms of professional sales that I was in, i.e. working for somebody, right? the systems were what somebody said they were. You're going to do it our way because we told you so. Now, is it, does it work? doesn't matter if it works you're going to comply with it and make it work. So you spend half your life as a professional salesperson trying to put a, a, a round peg in a square hole. So when I came across the system I currently work, use, and we know who we're talking about here, the number one thing that I saw and the number one attraction was 
Nobody told me this is the only way things will work. In fact, you told me it wasn't. Nobody said there's only one way to use it because, quite frankly, there's hundreds. The one thing that got my attention was I can get you in front of people. That's all I asked for. Right. Well, yeah, you know, a professional salesperson, that's all they want. Exactly. Just put me in the ring. Right. You know, because I, I, I'll win this fight. Just get me to the dance. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> you know, it, and, exactly. And so many times uh, the talent to win that match is different than the talent to put that match together. Right. You know, right. it takes the Don Kings of the world to, to, to put the Mike Tysons, you know, if you will, a mixed metaphor there a bit, but you, you get what I'm saying. And that's that distinction between sales and marketing that sometimes we as professional salespeople don't either understand or appreciate. Yeah, I can, uh, I can certainly speak from didn't understand or appreciate till it, till it, uh, Smack me upside the head. <laughs> and I'm like, oh boy, I had to learn how to do this other marketing thing. <laughs> yeah, for real, for real. Well, you know, uh, like I said at the uh, front end here, you know, to do anything great takes energy, it takes effort, it takes execution. One of my favorite uh, quotes that I learned from Coach Dean Smith, because I know you're a Tar Heel uh, person as well. Uh, gotcha. I went to basketball camp river and he saw me just working up a lather. I mean, I was just, I was expending all this energy because I wanted to impress Coach Smith because uh, I had dreams of one day I would be able to play with the guy that recruited and coached and knew Michael Jordan. And he saw me just working up this lather and uh, he had something very profound and he didn't put me on the spot to embarrass me, but he was sort of using me as an analogy to teach this group. And it was simply this effort is commendable. Effort is commendable. Everybody talks about how hard they try. I tried. I did this. I did this. I did this. He said, effort is commendable, but ex execution is commissionable. In other words, you get paid to execute. You don't get paid to try. And so, so many times I have gotten frustrated in business and in life and, and doing different things, Tom, because boy, I was working up a lather. I mean, I'm trying right. to impress, but Hey, I'm trying Tom, but you know, effort is commendable, <laughs> but execution but it doesn't pay a lot of bills. It don't pay <laughs> any. So you have to stay motivated to push past the disappointments that effort doesn't pay off so that you can sharpen your skills to a point. You can sharpen your craft. You can develop your craft to a point where it's no longer, it's really like what I do today. This isn't much effort. I know my business. I know these tools. I know everything I need to do. There's no hardly, and we're not working up a sweat here, No, right. but we know how to execute on some just key things that's going to bring in the money. So, but it took a long time to get there. And what pushed me through was, Staying motivated. Tom, how do you stay motivated? How important is staying motivated? Well, it, motivation is important regardless of what aspect of life you're talking about. I don't care if you're talking about business, I'm talking about, you're talking about your health, your relation. It, it all requires some level of motivation. And for me, that motivation is direct in direct relationship to the things that I either feel I am lacking or f realize I don't know. And my motivation moves directly to learning those things and, and not necessarily becoming an expert, but becoming proficient enough to be able to, to, in, uh, to, to put them out there and make them work, to implement. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, so motivation to me is a constant, uh, it, it's a con it constantly evolves, but it is completely about self-improvement. Yeah. Because if you're doing those things, the things you're applying it to business, life, health, whatever, are automatically raised to a level you didn't think you were going to see. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Well, Tom is bringing the heat tonight. I think uh, River has got an announcement. River, what, what you got to say over there? So uh, tonight's show is sponsored by the book You Are Worth More. Go to youareworthmorebook.com and get a signed copy today. Also, due to the interview tonight, we won't be answering questions live. However, if you are in the chat room and you can enter, you can enter questions there and one of your elite trainers would be happy to help. That's great. That's great. And, and Tom, you've got something to, to, to announce with your radio show, I believe. 
Yeah, the, uh, the, the next episode will fall on uh, this Thursday at 6 Eastern time. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, funny you brought these questions to <laughs> light tonight because... Uh, I'm setting the, you the up, vast, huh? <laughs> yeah, the vast majority of the content this week is about that, and it even goes a little musical. Oh, man. I, uh, I'm the kind that will find inspiration in, in a lot of ways, yeah. but a ton of them in, in a, a ton of inspiration in certain song lyrics. And we're going to examine, uh, we're going to examine one of those and see how it relates. That is awesome. Well, I can't wait. And you're always bringing the heat and up on our screen right now. Uh, I'm proving that Tom at one point was a rock star with the saxophone himself. This picture comes from Miss Sellers. She sent oh, this she to did not. <laughs> Yes, she did. <laughs> oh, she did not. And so Tom knows wow. a little <laughs> Tom knows a little bit about rock and roll and so and, and music. And uh, I, I just thought it was so apropos to have the drummer from the group Chicago on the same night that Tom from Chicago town a sax player it probably grew up i know you did listening did. yeah listening to chicago and earth wind and fire and all of those great chicago bands and are you betcha so what still a, do yeah yeah so it's just a great night tonight so like uh, river was saying we won't have time to take live questions because we get in it with uh from uh with tris here in just a second but you guys make sure you you go over and you check out tom's radio show it's a, it's a wonderful show it's always uh power packed with value that you're you're going to walk away from and i do want to encourage you uh the entrepreneur on fire known as john lee dumas will either be this coming week or the following week we've got to line up our schedules trying to get on track with him he's got a new book out that i want to help him promote and he is just a, a wonderful wonderful example of how anybody including yours truly including tom up in shy town and and thousands of other people that i know and work with and work for and uh and have helped over the years how you can take your money business and life to new levels if you'll push past disappointment if you'll push past the negativity if you'll keep your eyes on the prize raise your gaze because you become what you behold and if all you're doing is looking at negativity all day and why things have to be the way they are and, and you can't do this and you can't do this i love the old cliche can't never could won't never will but i like to end it with this and maybe doesn't ever stick around long enough to see if it's possible you know i always add that one on there because sometimes people give themselves an out and say well maybe you know can't never yeah. could won't never will but maybe no maybe well, he's not committed <laughs> <laughs> I'd sure like to. <laughs> Maybe one day. Maybe one. Well, may um, you know, like uh, Garth Brooks says. Well, tomorrow may never come. So you know, let's look, get in the dance today, baby. I mean, now now's the time you've got. And. Uh, Tom, what would you tell people that's out there on the fence looking at maybe one of our packages, Elite Packages Plus Packages? Let's talk about the Elite. What do you find value as we close up here and get into the interview with uh, Chris? What do you find the most valuable in that Elite membership at TW3? You know, you may not like this answer, but I'm going to give it anyway. And I think I've probably shared this with you before. The amount of upgrades within that package are, are ridiculous, but... Quite frankly, the first two have a ton of stuff in them too. So, you know, you're moving up for to a lot more tools and tactics. But for my money, if there was nothing additional involved uh, technically, and all I paid the extra money for was the elite mastermind, that would do it for me. Uh, the amount of value, the amount of the amount of learning, the amount of people that are drawn to your story that most of us have heard our, you know, their common names we listen to anyway. So if you look at, and I know you know better than I, what it costs to go to a conventional mastermind group on a monthly basis, we're stealing it by the elite package. <laughs> well, I do appreciate you saying that. And, uh, I'll take that compliment and thank you, Tom. But, uh, I, I just, you have to touch people where they're at. And I think sometimes it's, you know, not to get religious on people, but I am going to go there because it's my show and I can. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, you know, uh, Jesus was after the souls of man. He was after the heart of people. But he recognized that sometimes to touch people with mindset, you have to touch their stomachs first. And so he gave them bread 
and fish so that they'd stick around on that hill long enough, then that he could change their hearts and their minds. And I think the higher, uh, higher calling to an entrepreneur is to think better, to, to, to uh, self-actualize, to, to be able to, to maximize the capacities that they have been given by the good Lord. But sometimes that smacks as just feel good, psych psycho babble nonsense because if you're out there and you're like terry i'm an insurance agent i'm a real estate agent i'm a car salesman i'm this i'm that or whatever and i just need leads well you got to hit them there first well let me give you a tactical practical put your hands on tangible way to to make this happen so you can have a sustained way of doing good business but if you want to go beyond even that beyond your imagination, to be able to scale beyond what you could ever think, dream, or imagine as possible, then that, and, and sustain this ability to stay motivated, stay inspired, and to stay creative, because the markets are always changing. The market is constantly changing. And so what worked yesterday doesn't work today. And what you learned yesterday that brought you to the level of success you are today there's going to come a time in everybody's life and everybody's journey in business, especially in personal, that you've got to evolve. You've got to get better because yesterday's tactics won't solve today's problems. And if there's not someone out there that's writing you a new script, then who's going to. Pro so if you have developed in that time period, the mindset and the ability to think beyond your, your, your current level of thinking, well, you can solve today's problems within your own self. And that's what the beauty of these masterminds and the beauty of higher level coaching. And Tom's right. I mean, some of these masterminds, I, you know, I, I'll say it just because I, I'm not telling on anybody else, but I'm spending around $2,500 a month just to sit in a round table around a bunch of high achieving entrepreneurs, $2,500 a month. And you talk to most people, they go, you are crazy. That's more than what a house costs, a mortgage on some. Yeah. But if you saw the exponential return on investment, it, I, you know, it's some people buy, you know, pay college tuitions, other people, <laughs> you, know, you know, but you, if you want to go to the next level, you have to grow to the next level. And, uh, I, I, I appreciate Tom recognizing the value that, uh, and it does, it's not about me. It's just about that group. When you get a group of people like Tom, like Greenbacks, like Miller time, like, uh, Miss Spelling Bee, all of these people from different backgrounds, different experiences, different, uh, vantage points on life and business. And they all come together and say, okay, what, what we got going on? Well, I'd like to learn how to do this. I'm going to speak into it from my vantage point, but Tom will bring it up and say, well, because this isn't a car business, let me tell you this, Terry, because I'm not, I've never been in car business. Don't know anything about it, but he does. Mm -hmm. So it's just beautiful. And I appreciate you, uh, uh, appreciating that Tom. Well, I, uh, I, I say what I feel. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, uh, that was the one, the only, the legend from uh, Chi Town and uh, Tom Sellers. And when we get back, we're going to talk to another legend from Chicago. And that is the, the legendary rock and roll drummer from the group Chicago, Kenny Loggins, Michael McDonald, Al Jarreau, uh, Richard Marks, and every other hit maker from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. That's Tristan Bowden coming up right after this. Hi, Bob Christie here. Those who know me call me Coach C. I have a new show on the TW3 radio network. It's called Coach C's Inside Pitch, and we're live every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock on TW3radio.com. I've been in baseball more than 60 years. Six decades is a long time. I learned a lot about baseball, but I learned a whole more, lot more about life and what it takes to be successful. I was a player. I was an umpire for more than 35 years, and then I became a coach. And I coached for a long time. My final two years were as a college coach up in Pennsylvania. I never really saw myself as a baseball coach. I saw myself as a teacher. My job was to take young boys and make them young men, take young adults, and get them ready to face life after school. Baseball was simply the tool that I used to make this happen. My guests and I are going to talk about what we learned on the sports field and how it translates into life in general. I think you'll enjoy that. It's going to be a lot of fun. So please join me every Tuesday night, 7 o'clock Eastern at TW3radio.com. We'll see you there. 
Coffee family, I am joined by the timekeeper and groove engineer for many of the songs I danced to, dated with, and lived life through in my high school and young adult years. Songs like Footloose by Kenny Loggins, Hold On to the Nights by Richard Marks, and tons of Chicago tunes were all hits that crawled out of the pocket and groove this man provided. What a distinct honor to welcome Tris M. Bowden. Tris, how are you? Uh, I'm doing great. Thank you, Terry. Oh, man, it's, it's great to be here. so good to have you on the show tonight. What an inspiration. This is our, uh, we're calling it the uh, month of love, and we're just uh, wanting to encourage, inspire people in this time where there's a lot of lockdowns going on, businesses changed on people, and uh, so if we can get uh, people that have inspired us through their music and art and their lives, we want to get them out in front of our people just to let them know, hey, it's going to be all right. <laughs> yes, sir. Absolutely. Yes, so I got three categories I want to cover tonight. Uh, if it's okay with you, I want to talk about your time recording, touring, and playing with Kenny Loggins, of course, and, and of course, the mega band Chicago. And then finally, I want to talk about your incredible win over cancer, which is just an in inspiration to a lot of us who've had to be touched by or know someone who's been touched by that terrible disease. And what an inspirational story that you are. And not to use a musical pun, but you are the inspiration <laughs> to so many. Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> Out there. Well, I'm happy to, to be able to inspire some inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> for real, brother, for real. It it could have gone another way. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But you uh, kept kept hope alive and kept the groove going. So that's what it's all about. Uh, look, speaking of the groove, let me just ask you, how did you first get drawn into music? I mean, how did you get the musical bug? How did that start? Oh, man. Well, I uh, I knew very, very early on that that, uh, that I wanted to play music and, and uh, that I would be in some way involved as a kid you know my 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 home was always filled with music my uh my uh both my mom and dad you know uh, listened to all kinds of stuff from from big band music to you know to dave brubeck to to you know harry belafonte calypso that, that album to all kinds of uh uh just a whole eclectic kind of mishmash of, of different different uh music and as a result, I was drawn to all different kinds of, of music, but drumming in particular. And I tell the story about I had an uncle, a favorite uncle that traveled. He was uh, uh, used to race sailboats, and he was in uh, a race from uh, Honolulu to to Papeete in Tahiti, and uh, and and so uh, he fell in love with a Tahitian woman while, <laughs> while he was there. Stayed there for a couple of years and came back speaking French and, and Tahitian and playing Tahitian guitar. But he also brought back a Toede, which is uh, actually a, a, it's a Tahitian drum. Uh, it's a log drum. And uh, I and all these albums of, of Polynesian drumming. Uh, and man, I, God, I couldn't get enough of that. There was an album called Drums of Bora Bora. And that thing, man, I played over and over again. And I still now, when I hear myself soloing, I hear myself referencing some of those phrases I heard all the way back then when I was like five or six years old, you know? So, uh, oh, man. yeah. That is so I, cool. I always knew I'd, I'd be in some way involved, you know? With music. Just sort of awoken something inside you. That is awesome, brother. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It was really touched by it. Yeah. yeah. So when you get started and you start playing, you've got all that musical uh, influence of Brubeck and all those folks in big band and the Tunisian uh, influences that your uh, family brought in, your uncle. What other influences, maybe set drummers, uh, that when you first started, you know, getting behind that kit and listening, oh, yeah. who were those early influences to young Tristan Bowden? Well, I had my ear glued to the to the rock and roll radio stations, of course, you know. And so, early on in the in the late fifties and early sixties, you know, uh, there was a lot of instrumental guys that actually. There was a guy named Sandy Nelson who had a, a song called "Let There Be Drums," and there was another one called "Teen Beat," you know. That was mostly, you know, pretty simple 
phrases on the on the tom toms and that. But anyway, man, I love the sound of that. And uh, so so he was an early influence for sure. Uh, as was, of course, you know, I mean, all the, the music yeah, I was hearing from my folks, you know, Joe, Joe Morello and uh, Gene Krupa, Sing Sing Sing, you know, yeah. with uh, Ben Goodman and, and uh, all those great big band drummers, you know. Uh, but man, rock and roll really spoke to me yeah. uh, in a big way. And so all of those guys, you know, that played on all those early records, uh, Earl Palmer and, you know, all those guys, man, huge influence on me, you know, Hal Blaine, you know, all of that. And then, uh, of course, when the British invasion happened, I, I wanted to be in one of those bands, too, you know. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you've heard the running joke. I told uh, uh, your former bandmate Bill of this, and he got a kick out of it. Of course, I think he's heard it. And that, that guy could have been a stand-up comedian if music passed him by, because he is like one oh. zinger right after the next. So I'm sure you've got stories from the road about... Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bill is one of the funniest guys I've ever known in my life, man. Yeah. And he's so fast, too, you know. Oh, yeah. He's just right off yeah. the cuff. I mean, but I was telling him, I said, I heard this interview one time, and, it, you know, it was, uh, I think it was Paul McCartney and all these, and the the, the, the story goes that uh, they asked, uh, uh, did they think Ringo was the greatest drummer in the world? And one of them quipped, and I can't remember which one. He says, I don't know if he's the greatest drummer in the band. You know, they were yeah. just. <laughs> right. No legend has it. Yeah. Apparently it's been debunked. Has that been debunked or something? Someone said it's been, a, yeah, so I don't know. But it was a pretty funny line. It sounds like something Lennon would say. Yeah, I just, it, I could, you can imagine it if you've ever been in a band, because you know how guys like to just rib one another, so. Oh man, absolutely. Yeah. Oh my God, man. Yeah. And drummers, unfortunately, uh, you know, have been the butt of, if you pardon the expression, of too many jokes. Well, well sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you probably but, got a book of them. Oh yeah, man. There's some funny ones too, but of course we've, we've come up with a few ourselves for our fellow <laughs> instrumentalists too. So <laughs> I am sure you have, I'm sure you yeah. have. Uh, <laughs> So let's talk about your years with Kenny Loggins, man. Uh, I know that there's a story. There's something about the uh, the song Footloose that I remember you talking about. I don't remember hearing it on another interview or speaking, uh -huh. uh, hearing you at the NAMM show or something, but there's an interesting story behind that song. I was wondering if you could share it with the audience. Okay, well, I've, I've actually told this story a bunch at the risk of, of repeating myself. Uh, Kenny uh, is very, very much a perfectionist and very demanding of, of his musicians and himself, to be fair. You yeah. Know? And uh, as a result, you know, this, his shows are always, you know, as close to perfection as you'll ever see. I mean, and that goes through all the way back to Loggins and Messina. But anyway, part of that quest for uh, for excellence includes uh, sound checks that are actually, you know, two hour rehearsals. And uh, so anyway, uh, long story short, Kenny knew that, that uh, he was going to have the theme song for this movie uh, uh, coming out called Footloose and had written a song for it, for it and had us rehearsing it day in i mean you know at every sound check for hours on end and we'd all like you know we knew the song inside now we've been playing it on the road you know for for months and uh so it finally came time to record it we got off the road and we went to the record plant in, in la and and uh we recorded it in two takes and now this band was like you know band of aces it was nathan east on bass, oh my gosh yeah buzzy feet on guitar yeah. and neil larson on keyboards and steve wood on keyboards and i mean they're they're incredible heck like, i'd sound good in front of that band <laughs> yeah <laughs> so so man i uh uh, I tell the story that we cut it. It's true in two takes. One was for sound, and the second one was the was the take. We virtually just lifted our legs, our collective legs, and peed on it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
And then I went back, you know, after the fact and overdubbed Simmons, you know, electronic, yeah, the electronic. Drum, that drum breakdown and that. But, but man, I remember walking out after the session with, with Nathan East and I, you know, kind of cracking up going, well, that's the last time we'll ever have to hear that piece of crap again. <laughs> right? <laughs> And then the thing goes number one everywhere in the world at the same time. You know? <laughs> and, and Terry, I have to I have to admit to you that that uh, that for me when I couldn't turn the radio dial without hearing it at all on the you know on every station, I did like it a little bit. You liked it just a little bit more. <laughs> Yeah, right. Oh, uh, well, what's it like to hear yourself on radio, even to this day? What well, is that man, like? I, I, I've always said that it's something I'll never get tired of, and I mean it. It's like it is something that still, I mean, the radio was so important to me growing up sure. and listening to all, all these, you know, incredible artists, you know, like, uh, through, and I still do. Uh listen to the radio quite often uh but but it was something that i i never dare dream that big that you know one day i'd be you know i could hear myself on the radio and so uh i remember the first time i did i think i was uh, i was in a band called honk and it, that was like 1970 one or so and it was like oh my god I, I i'm on the I, i'm actually playing on the, i'm on, on the, the radio, radio. Yeah. yeah and so that thrill has never really diminished i mean you know uh over the years even though i've been fortunate enough to play on so many great uh, with so many great artists and, and great recordings you know so uh i'll never get tired of it man. well i know it's got to be surreal and that's 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 got that's got to be a, a fun life experience, you know. Uh, it's one thing, you know, in our business when when someone does well or or we want to brag on someone, we say, "Hey, man, you're a rock star." But then to actually be one, <laughs> I mean, it well, just takes it to another level, man. So just oh, bro. well, I I uh, there again, you know, I never never had had seen myself, you know, or my future as, as, uh, as, as that. And, uh, I'm just so grateful. Man, uh, what a great, things. what a great life. What a great life. And, uh, and, and what, what, uh, privilege it is to, uh, to be able to share it with you, you know, okay. share your experiences, you know, through you and get to, to see your art in, in your life and just observe from afar. And that's one of the, the great experiences of, uh, of, of being in that position, I would imagine, is uh, oh, man. people get oh, to enjoy man. the ride with you. Oh, oh man, well, thank you. I, uh, yeah, geez, I, I'm still, uh, I still pinch myself. Truly, you know? <laughs> so, really, I mean, you know, like, like uh, for so many people, you know, just getting one of the the breaks that I got in my career. I mean, you know, playing with Kenny for all those years, getting to play on all those hit records. It's really what put me on the map. But if it had all ended after my my uh, my tenure with him, that would have been great. Geez, I mean, uh, what a, that, I would have felt so blessed just with that. But sure. then after that, I mean, I you know got the I was with, with Al Jarreau for four years, you know, too, and and I've gotten to work with so many of my heroes, you know, and and then to get the call. Uh, from Bill Champlin asking me if I wanted to join Chicago. It was like, oh, are you kidding me? What? Yeah, that's just amazing. <laughs> and, and that was nearly 30 years, man. Nearly, it was 28 years with the band. So, you wow. know, any one of those would have been a, a, a career for me. <laughs> well, you know talking about Chicago, I want you to settle a debate that I have had going on at least, well, at least 25 years with uh -huh. uh, fellow musicians and engineers and studio people and all of this. So I want to take you back to the early 90s. You were on a double-kick uh, DW Red Kit. God, you remember that. Wow. <laughs> I do. I, that's how far back I go. And, and wow. watching you. And, and just uh, you, every time you'd come to the southeast with the band, uh, whether you were in Charlotte, Atlanta, all the way up to Virginia in those areas, we, we, we'd we would make the pilgrimage. We're going to go see Chicago, and because we were just big uh, 
fans of yours and theirs and, and, and like. What well, this kit had an extension on the front end of both bass pedals or bass bass yeah. drums. And so uh-huh. here's the question. Was that a microphone? You know, because they used to in studios, they would make a a, a speaker it, right. with a big, large diaphragm. Was that a microphone or was that just an extension and it was another drum added to it? What was that? Okay, that was a brainstorm of John Goods uh, from DW Drums, you know, who is just a, a drum absolute genius uh, designer. And uh, I mean, he's legendary, as you probably know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was his brainstorm to create another additional double-headed extension bass drum. So it was a, a shell, uh, you know, this big with two heads on it, but also a microphone mounted inside of that to, to as a resonator. Rick, a, you owe me 50 bucks. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so... Later on, you know, the Yamaha came out with that that smaller version or whatever, and that a lot of guys are still using, uh, and not so many guys are using the DW thing. But it it actually, uh, uh, man, it really worked. I mean, you know, you, your sound guy, the front house uh, sound man, could dial up as much or or as little of the John Bonham effect as he wanted depending on what, what the room could handle. Right. And depending on the song, you know, too. So so it was just kind of another color to paint with, you know. And, oh, and, yeah. Well, listen, when you guys were playing those outdoor palladiums, uh-huh. uh, I mean, it was fat and it was in your chest. I mean, you felt I mean, it. it. That's, and, I love it when it's like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, what, what's the old saying? If you want to get them to move, give them the groove, you know. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Yeah. 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 That low end, man. Yeah, that speaks to people physically. Yeah, physically. You know, so- <laughs> You're moving them, baby. <laughs> yeah, I want to move some air. <laughs> oh, my word. Well, here's here's a great question that uh, that only someone like yourself could answer. You're very unique in this, in the fact that you come over to a mega band that had a history before you got there. Uh, you were in the middle of creating new history because you're right there on the, 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 the coming up on their rebirth with David Foster and all of that. Uh-huh. And then you go touring with them, you know, for 30 years. And so uh-huh. they, their brand, if you will, their sound, their, their whatever, it's sort of established. It's sort of set, you know. Uh, yeah. And here's the question I've always wondered when you're in, because they're just a touring monster. I mean, in Chicago, just a touring monster. Yeah. How do you keep your sanity? You might love these songs like I do, but uh-huh. you're playing them night after night after yeah. night. And not yeah. only that, you're part of the band that doesn't have maybe the uh, latitude to go off the map as maybe like Champlin can just blues all over something when he gets bored or, yeah. you know what I'm saying? I mean, he can, he can, okay, I'm bored. So, but you've got, cause they're, everybody's playing against you. You're yeah. <laughs> yeah. so how did you do it? <laughs> well, I tell you, I am um, playing a groove and, 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 and creating a feel with the rhythm section to me is is the higher art and and as such i am forever trying to further hone and and get better at doing that and it's a lifetime quest so so for me uh you know i was always just trying to improve on the on the night before or or get back to a to a, a performance that i remember that was just as close to to uh, to my idea of great as, right. as it could be your and, target, uh, right? Yeah, my target, right? So so uh, uh, and I felt also that you know being a drummer, it was my responsibility, particularly in a band that big with that many players, to make sure the foundation was there, right? For uh, for it to feel right, you know. Right. And if I wanted to play 
too much or, or experiment too much. Um, it just, it wasn't the, the, uh, the proper time or band to do that. In. Sure. I didn't. You know. So, whereas, you know, playing with Al Giroux, he, uh, even though he was uh, seen as an R&B artist, I mean, uh, as a jazz artist primarily, sure. uh, but crossed over into R&B, he always came from a jazz ethic, and he had a large band, too, where it was two horn players and all that, a couple background singers, percussion, you know, keyboards, and uh, the same kind of uh, instrumentation. Uh, but he wanted it fresh every night, you know, so, so, and, and his music sort of called for it. So right, right. Consequently, uh, you know, I, I try to stretch it, you know, every night, but I just kind of felt this responsibility in Chicago to, to make it sit right. Well, so, every night, and I've seen you guys a ton of times, every time I saw you, it was locked. I mean, oh, you, just, bro, thank you. you did, wow. you, you just locked it down. And, uh, I could tell, you know, with the, like when uh, Jimmy Pankow would uh, do a, a solo or something, it was different every night. It seemed like, cause he's just going to, I mean, it had its same themes and stuff, but he yeah. was playing with it. The horn players would play around Champlin played all the time, which I love. Oh, <laughs> but, Bill can't help himself. Yeah. He's, he's got to do, do that, man. And I love that. I do yeah. too. I do too. I mean, it's just, Man. Yeah. yeah, but I, I always thought about it's like poor Tris is back there, and he has just got he he's like he's got to carry the water for everybody so they can play. The, he's the parent back at the house making sure the bills are paid and everything. <laughs> well, I, well, I don't mind doing it. I'll tell you, honestly, it's uh you know I felt like it really was my responsibility, and I'm I'm happy to. Well, you, to have, it, well, so you shouldered it well, brother. And always, and, and another thing, uh, beyond your musical playing and all of that other stuff, every night, every time I've seen you, with a smile. It just seemed like you were having the time of your life, just back there, just the smiling. I mean, just just going at it, it was great. Well, it's, for, for the most part, always sincere, man, because, uh, you know, I, I, I've been so blessed to be able to do what I love my whole life. And and I just love being out there doing it and, right. and hopefully getting to make people happy in the process. You know? Well, it showed, it showed for sure. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, let me go. We'll finish up with these. Just a couple questions starting with the Kenny Loggins time period. What's your favorite memory from that time in that, oh, in man. that part of your career? Well, uh, the original Kenny Loggins band was truly magical. It was alchemy uh, to the 10th power going on with that. Uh, George Hawkins, who passed away just uh, a year before last, man, was one of my best friends in the world. One of the greatest bass players I've ever had the privilege of working with. And everybody in that band, man, from uh, uh, John Clark and Ben Stenham, the two horn players, to Brian Mann on keyboards, and Mike Hamilton on guitar. We just had this chemistry that was just incredible. And, and uh, Kenny really, you know, was careful about uh, George and John and Vince had worked with Loggins and Messina, but the rest of us, you know, it was a very careful process in selecting who he, he wanted and who, you know, gelled like we did. And, uh, man, getting to play on on uh, a few of those records, man, I tell you, like a uh, song like This Is It, you know, with Michael McDonald and, and Karen, that was the second tune they wrote together. <laughs> oh, and what a great tune. Yeah, the first tune was What a Fool Believes, right? That won a Grammy. What a batting average. And the second one won a Grammy. This is it, you know? So uh, uh, getting to, to do records like like Keep the Fire, that was the album that had that that uh, song on it, as well as so many other great ones. And uh, songs like Heart to Heart, too, you know, which uh, were, was another M Michael McDonald uh, and Kenny Loggins collaboration. And... Getting to play those records, man, you know, yeah, yeah, man, I'll forever owe him a debt of gratitude, you know, for, uh, for yeah, not only great songs, but the, like the soundtrack to so many people's lives, high school and college years. I mean, just what a great, yeah. what a great time period to be in music. Yeah, man, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you know, I mean, they, a lot of, there is that, that subheading, uh, uh, yacht rock, you know, <laughs> Well, that was like that was a period when I was really uh, 
they get a, a, a lot of hits quickly <laughs> with, with Benny and with other people. Sure. So, uh, so uh, I'm I I cheerfully embrace that term yacht rock. I really like it. Hey, <laughs> put me on the boat with you, brother. I'm right there. <laughs> <laughs> All That's right. great. Well, what's what's uh, some favorite memories of uh, being with uh, Chicago all those years? Oh man, it's just I've you know it was something that I had never really imagined in my wildest dreams that I'd be a part of that band someday. I mean, I've told the story a thousand times, but I'd seen them, the original band, when they were sixteen before they even had the first album out. Man. Oh wow. And, uh, and and was just absolutely flabbergasted. Man. I'd never seen a band that good, and uh, and and so I mean I would have never imagined I would have been a part of it. And so to be in a band of that importance, you know, yeah. and of that that uh, weight, if you will, because right. uh, I mean a couple of times that band's been the biggest band in the world, twice, you know, and. Uh, uh, two parts in their their 53 now years you know uh, uh, they they've managed to do that and so i i have real fond memories of, of traveling the world with them as well uh but but you know being in places like uh in uh, um what's uh, sri lanka or or <laughs> oh wow I remember uh some some places you wouldn't expect but um Oh, darn it. But anyway, where, you know, most people don't speak English yeah. and you look out and you're playing If You Leave Me Now and all the people are singing in perfect English, you know, and know every lyric, every nuance, every, you know, uh, every bit of that music. I mean, that's uh, that was it's so powerful to me, you know, and Wait, there, you know, it's a so far reaching, you know. Well, what's amazing is, uh, you know, all of these cover bands are popping up for every type of band and every band from the 70s and 80s, it seems like. Uh, uh, one of my favorite bands is out of Australia uh, called the uh, Henley uh, Street Country Club Band, and they can cover all kinds. But I was listening, uh, I fell up, fell on this uh, or tripped onto this uh, band, I guess a couple years ago from Russia, Len Leonard. Yeah. Uh, th these guys, I mean, can cover... Chicago. Yeah, they sure can, man. They, they know every nuance, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you listen to them speak, and you know English is not their native tongue. And, you know, it's it's some of them, I don't even know if they can speak English. But, boy, when it comes to playing and singing those hits. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, you know, I went to, to, to see them and met them all. They played near my home uh, a couple years back. And... Uh, you know, of course, I'd seen them online and was was amazed. You know, at their uh, their dedication to to uh, to those original records. You yeah, know, and eye to detail, and uh, God, they were just the nicest people. And Leon had himself. This is an interesting story. Maybe you know, uh, but back when he first heard Chicago in the Soviet Union, I mean, you couldn't even buy an electric guitar. You couldn't find one. He actually figured out or somehow divined uh, or got a hold of a manual to create uh, a pickup to, to build uh, a, an electric guitar by using the parts of a telephone. And he, so he built his, his own guitar. He, he built the coils for the pickup. Yeah, 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 for the pickups. Yeah, and, and uh, man... I mean, boy, I talk about like really wanting it. <laughs> wow. I love stories like that. You know, yeah. I just, yeah. just awesome. I didn't know. I'd never heard that. Yeah. And he's so, and such a great guy. And uh, as they all are, I mean, we became real good, good pals uh, immediately. Sure. And uh, they actually asked me to sit in with them. And I, I was very honored. I know Danny Serafin has sat in with them as well, as have a few few other uh, former members of, of Chicago. And uh, Robert's going to see him and some of us. What a cool thing. What an absolute. Yeah, I wanted to say, I remembered the country I was trying to think of. It wasn't Sri Lanka. It was Kuala Lumpur. That's where it really, 
it blew my mind. I, I, you know, I'd been supposed to travel there with Jero and with other artists, but it, it never happened. Yeah. And finally got there with, with, uh, with Chicago one year. And it just, it was just so, uh, unusual to, to see all these, these, uh, these beautiful Muslim ladies with their, you know, their veils and their everything. And their, yeah. And then if you leave me now, man, it was like, wow. <laughs> isn't, isn't that so wonderful? The power of music to cut across all that cultural and all the political nonsense that sometimes separates us. And yes. then boom. Yeah. Absolutely, man. It speaks to the heart. Man. Yeah. It gets all over. That only music can, you know, the human heart. What a wonderful gift to be able to to receive and to be able to give that you, you have for so many years. That's just awesome. Well, um, I want another a talk about another part of your life that uh, uh, you've inspired a ton of people, and it's not going to be on any top forty uh, chart, but it's just living your life and defeating cancer and your your journey through that. So, if you could tell. Tell me about your journey with being diagnosed, treated, and then ultimately defeating this terrible disease. Okay, all right. Well, uh, just prior to uh, to uh, having the CAT scan that that uh, uh, actually detected that I had lung cancer, it was actually stage three A uh, 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 non small cell lung lung cancer, uh, squamous cell specifically. Uh, I was in the best shape of my life, Terry. I was living in on the North Shore of Kauai uh, in the Hawaiian Islands and surfing big waves. And I, you know, I'm running, you know, like three miles a day and going to the gym as well, eating clean. And, you know, I mean, my my years, of course, I, I uh, uh, earlier, I sort of had a mis misspent youth you know, being in rock and roll. <laughs> sure. Haven't <laughs> we all? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was a smoker and a drinker and like rip snorting and everything, you know. And yeah. uh, but but uh man, I'd long before quit all of that. And so I was actually in the best shape of my life. And and uh and so anyway, I had uh um this uh year prior to the diagnosis had um, uh, an angio cat scan just to, just to see because of my smoking history and that right uh, whether there was any blockage in that and they had discovered some in my coronary arteries and so my um, I was seeing the cardiologist that said you know maybe we ought to have an another look it's been you know a year or two you know since we had that uh, we'll just check it out and, and so uh, and while we're there we'll have a look at your lungs so I got home. And by the time I got home after the CAT scan, the phone was ringing in the gym and he said, uh, well, I've got some, uh, some bad news, man. He said, you've got a seven centimeter tumor in your, uh, in your lung, in your right lung. So long story short, I, uh, I was like being hit with a baseball bat upside the head. I, uh, and I, you know, I'd always kind of feared it because of my smoking history, but I thought I'd, I'd been well after 11 years since I quit smoking and everything. And, and uh, so I thought I was out of the woods. But um, anyway, uh, so I uh, ended up going to Nashville to Vanderbilt, uh, which is very cutting edge, no pun intended, in their, <laughs> in their treatments uh, there or their, their cancer center. And uh, so I went through simultaneous chemo and uh, radiation you know, to shrink the tumor. And then they, uh, my surgeon took out two thirds of my right lung. Mm. And, uh, but the, with the spirometry before I, uh, I had the surgery and everything, you know, they test your lung capacity and all. Sure. And I have 130% of normal. And, uh, so my surgeon said, you know, by the time I'm done with you, you should probably be about normal. So, <laughs> so anyway, but he did, he cut out two thirds of my right lung. And uh, so I have one and a third. You've got three lobes on your right and then, you know, one or two on your on your left. Right. And, uh, so anyway, man, um, all through that, you know, I, uh, I just 
tried to remain positive. I knew how important I'd been told from other survivors how, how it's so easy to circle the drain and, and you can't help it once in a while in your attitude sure. because man, I thought it was a death sentence. Right. You know, uh, just the word cancer, but lung cancer specifically. So uh, anyway, um, I tried to, you know, continue to eat well and, and, uh, and exercise as much as I could, but I was really limited for, you know, at least a couple of years, and I still can't run like I, I used to, which I really miss. Uh, but but I got back in the gym as soon as I could, and and uh, and you know, walking on the treadmill and riding a bike and all of that, and then you know, surfing, you know, really has really helped me too, being a lifelong surfer. Uh, cause that paddling is, is like really good CV and, oh, yeah. was, you know, the size I used to like of, of waves. I mean, like I said, I was living on the North shore of Kauai about the time I was diagnosed and it gets big there, man. Oh but, yeah. But now I just surf small waves and I only a long board and I, but I really have, I, I've, I'm still surfing and I'm still having fun. And I'm still playing drums, man. And so I, I am so lucky because the reality is, uh, the stage I was was staged at, and the type of, of uh, lung cancer it was, there was only a 14% chance that I I would make it to five years, and I'm pushing 12 years now. So that is so awesome, Trius. Congratulations, brother. So grateful, I tell you, man. I tell you, it's so Ooh. great. What a great story, and and thank you for sharing that. You know, with the the backside of 2020 and this pandemic stuff, you know, we've had several people that have had to go through COVID, and we've had a few that's even been touched by cancer uh, yeah. this this past year. And uh, yeah. one in particular, a friend of mine up in Chicago, he's a radio personality of ours on the TW3 Radio Network, and yeah. uh, he was a cancer survivor. And as a matter of fact, he started a radio program in that market called not done yet and uh he's been advocating you know for for awareness and um more things to be done in that space to help people from chicago big chicago fan so uh please give him my best i definitely will and tell him i I know he's he's already a survivor so he knows what to do he knows what to do he He knows knows what to do (laughs) (laughs) exactly exactly Well, Tris, uh, you got anything going on you want us to to promote or to mention? Well, I'm putting a band together, but I can't really give you too many details yet. But I, I will say that they're all like aces that have all participated in uh, with artists that we all know and love and been a part of their band and the recordings uh, thereof. And uh, so it's going to be real fun. We were five rehearsals in when uh when you know the zombie apocalypse <laughs> when 2020 showed its you know ugly head it was sounding great man so we're looking forward to getting back together what? and uh and i i started a book a few years ago and then uh my my whole uh, hard drive crashed and i thought i'd lost it and i thought god now recovered it and so i hope to get started again on a on a book uh it's sort of a autobiographical, I guess, but originally it was going to be sort of more cancer centric and being a drummer that, and also a cancer survivor, a good friend of mine said, why don't you call it beat it? So, <laughs> there you go. Love so it. That's the working title anyway, now for, for the book. So. I love it. Well, listen, when you get ready to, to sell and promote, please come back and let us help you uh, get the word out because, uh, yeah. You know, the world needs to hear more and see more of Tris and Bowden. Oh, man. Thank you so much, Terry. Thanks for being on. All right. It was a pleasure. All really right, enjoyed it. Thank you, brother. You're listening to TerryWilson3.com. Inspiring, informative, and entertaining content for the entrepreneur and small business owner. And now, back to the TW3 Studios with Terry Wilson.
Well, I hope you got a lot out of tonight. Uh, Tom on the front end from Chi-Town dropping value bombs. Tris giving his story. And, uh, you know, it's just amazing. I, I, I have never met anyone. I want to encourage you. If you're feeling down and out tonight, if you're feeling discouraged, if you're feeling distraught, if you're feeling dismayed, if you're feeling like, man, it's just everything's just piling on all the time. I want you to hear the stories of all these people. Tris you know, having a life pushed back on him because of cancer, Tom cancer pushing back on him, uh, myself and financial overturns. The point is this life is hard, but it's worth the effort. Life is difficult, but it's worth the determination to take a hold of the God given talents you have and not get discouraged and not give up and not quit. Look past the problem to the joy that's set before you on the other side of whatever it is that you're having to go through. So I just want to encourage you tonight, go over to terrywilson3.com, get the first four chapters of my book. If you are on that list, by the way, if you sign up to get on my list, which I give you the first four chapters, uh, e-version, you're going to get a special alert in the coming days of where you can get the audio version of that book for free as well and a special offer for to work with me that is the the most affordable thing I have ever done. You're going to get the audio book. You're going to get weekly uh, training with me. You're going to get a lot of stuff, and I've packaged it together in a way that it's affordable for anyone because I want to touch and help more people in 2021 than I've ever done before. And I just feel like uh, if if we're going to see the world turn and we're going to see people's lives changed and we're going to see people self-actualize and become a better version of themselves, then we've got to get good content the good news in front of people that they are worth more. You're made by from and for the purposes of greatness. You're not a cosmic accident that just crawled out because of lightning striking a mud puddle billions of years later. Like Zig Ziglar says, you are a meaningful specific and you can have more, do more and experience more. And uh, until next time, this is Terry with Terry Wilson, com. Thank you for listening to Terry Wilson, com today. If you've decided you are worth more, then go to terrywilson3.com now and get a free digital sample copy of the book. You are worth more. Listen, no one's going to give you what you're worth but you. So stop putting off and get started earning, enjoying, and experiencing what you are worth today. Go to terrywilson3.com now to start your journey today. That's terrywilson3.com.